The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Managing Liability in the Me Too Era. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have two audio options to choose from, computer audio or by calling in via phone call. To switch between the two, just click on the circle next to your preferred audio option in the audio section of your GoToWebinar panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Our speakers today are Tiffany Relaford and Jennifer Jackson, attorneys at Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston. Good afternoon. So this is Tiffany Relaford speaking. We're going to roll right into it, managing liability in the Me Too era. So our first part of our presentation is what do these three have in common? Um, we have Jeremy Pivens. Harvey Weinstein, and Kevin Spacey. First, they've all been accused of sexual harassment. And let's just start with Harvey Weinstein. He's our tale of the serial offender. Mr. Weinstein has had more than 80 women come forward with accusations of sexual harassment, as well as allegations of rape. His claim was that it was always consensual. People knew about the behavior and they let it continue. He eventually was fired from his own company and is facing criminal prosecution. This is Jennifer Jackman, good morning. Um, this is, uh, next is Jeremy Pivens. <clears throat> we look at him as was he falsely accused and that's an issue that we're seeing come up in the workplace um, as complaints are on the rise. Uh, he was accused by three separate women, and he took an allegedly pass a lie detector test. So the issue is, does passing a lie detector test mean he's innocent? No, they're not um, legally admissible, but it certainly helped him in terms of his uh, media presence and the court of public opinion. And finally, we have Kevin Spacey, which we refer to as a diversion tactic failure. Uh, the allegations against Kevin Spacey were that he assaulted a minor, um, he issued a quick apology, and that's in quotes because it wasn't really an apology because he said he could not recall, but then tried to divert attention by opening up about his sexual orientation. This was a, a, a publicity fail. His uh, diversion tactic was an utter failure, and the House of Cards staff says he actually created a hostile work environment um, all along while working with him, and once these issues were raised, his show was canceled. Um, he had a movie that went straight to Netflix, I believe, and really we've seen his career take um, a nosedive. So, in light of these three individuals and more that have come forward, sexual harassment claims are on the rise. In 2015, the EEOC reported 6,870 sexual harassment complaints were filed. Between 2010 and 2016, Private employers paid nearly $700 million to employees arising from sexual harassment claims filed with the EEOC. And as of October 2018, the EEOC has already filed 41 sexual harassment lawsuits, which is a more than 50% increase since 2017. In addition to that, as of October 2018, sexual harassment claims filed with the EEOC in 2018 increased by more than 12%, from 2017. So we're certainly seeing an upward trend with regard to sexual harassment claims. So what is sexual harassment? Well, the definition is unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature constitutes sexual harassment when submission to or rejection of this conduct explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment unreasonably inter interferes with an individual's work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. So what is covered under a harassment? It's more than you may think. It's, it can be what we all know of the supervisor harassment of a subordinate. So that's what we've seen a lot in the Me Too era that of the most publicly um, 
seen claims with Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, Jeremy Piven, uh, the list goes on and on. Stephen Wynn from Wynn Resorts, it's not just actors. Um, and that's that quid pro quo type, that supervisor harassment of a subordinate. But there's also coworker harassment. So it can be harassment of people at the same level in the organization. It can also be harassment by a third party, which could be a guest or a vendor. And that's a difficult concept to really understand because how can an employer be liable for conduct over people whom they exercise no control? But there actually is and can be liability for that. So if you're put on notice that an employee is being harassed by, for example, the UPS delivery person who sees the receptionist or um, every day or you know twice a week, then you do have a duty to intervene. There's also same-sex harassment. So men can harass men, women can harass women, uh, and same race harassment when you're looking at racial discrimination and harassment. It can occur in a variety of circumstances, including but not limited to the victim as well as the harasser may be a woman or a man. It doesn't have to be the opposite sex as we just reviewed. The harasser can be the victim supervisor. It could be the agent of the employer. So that could be like a board of director, a supervisor in another area, a coworker or a non-employee. The victim does not have to be the person who's harassed, but it could be anyone affected by the offensive conduct. So it could be someone who's just witnessing it. Um, unlawful sexual harassment can occur without in, um, economic injury uh, to or discharge of the victim. So what that means is it doesn't have to end in a firing or a demotion or a change in the terms and conditions of employment. If it's egregious enough or hostile enough, it could still be considered sexual harassment. Um, but the critical factor is that the conduct must be unwelcome. So supervisors have a duty to maintain a workplace that is free of harassment. What does that mean? That means they should respond to employees' concerns. Um, ignorance is not going to be a defense, so they can't claim that they didn't know what was going on. They need to be proactive and monitor workplace behaviors, know what's going on with their staff, or know if something seems off that they should probably inquire about it. Take complaints seriously, but also keep those complaints confidential investigate and take appropriate corrective action and what that correction action is is going to depend on your results of your investigation and the facts that are at issue but there needs to be some sort of action taken and also making sure that they're communicating the harassment and discrimination policies to the staff um, there's no use in having a policy if your staff doesn't know what the policy is and lastly, document. Make sure they document all of the steps and the actions that they've taken in response to a complaint. So what constitutes a complaint? Well, any notification by the victim or witness of improper conduct is going to be a complaint. What if they tell you that they're coming to you as a friend and not as their boss? Um, what if they tell you that they're just venting and they don't want you to do anything? What if it's another partner who's not complaining, but just relaying a story to you? These all constitute complaints. There is no off the record conversation, especially when that conversation is had with a manager or supervisor or somebody that's in a position of authority to do something about the complaints. If the conduct sounds like it's related to any protected uh, factor, regardless of what the intention was, it needs to be reported to HR or the appropriate um, authority if you don't have an HR department in your organization. There are no magic words that need to be used to be considered a complaint. So the next step in the process, if you receive a complaint, it really depends on your organization. If you're large enough and you actually have an HR department, then you want to consult with HR. And that's really important because they're the ones that would typically have knowledge of whether there have been any prior complaints how they handle other complaints against other people so that they can be consistent with their policies and procedures. If you don't have HR, or even if you do and you, you're concerned with the complaint that you've received, contact counsel to make sure that you follow the process appropriately. Then you wanna follow up with an email documenting the complaint. And the, there's a couple of reasons for the documentation that puts everyone on notice of what it was that happened. Um, you want to you want to email the person who's brought the complaint to you, basically summarizing what they said to you. 
and inviting them to correct it if you've missed anything. You want to avoid discussing your own, well, that's your first email or documentation, but then you want to email it to HR as well, documenting what was said to you. In that email, you're going to discuss what was said, who said it, what was their demeanor, and you want to avoid discussing your own opinions in the email. You don't want to say, I think that the person was lying or they were telling the truth, but what you would say is, what, what did you observe? Just the facts as was reported or observed by you. So you can say, the person came to me crying versus they seemed upset, or I think that they were really upset. Confidentiality is something Tiffany mentioned earlier, and so it's really important that your policy provides that there's confidentiality, but that you maintain the confidentiality as well. Um, and we're having an issue with the slide progression. And so with the confidentiality, it's, you can't guarantee confidentiality because clearly you can only have it, um, hold on, sorry, we're having a little technical issue. You can only guarantee confidentiality to the extent that it still allows for an appropriate investigation because the person who's being accused has to be able to know what they're being accused of in order to respond. But all the, rec the records and information regarding the investigations, once they've been reported to whoever's going to be reviewing it, need to be kept confidential to the extent allowed by law. It may have to be disclosed to, disclosed to another party if litigation arises. Um, it should not be discussed with any, um, the internal investigation should not be discussed with anyone outside the investigative process. Now, when you're interviewing witnesses, you wanna make it clear that you're gonna maintain confidentiality to the extent possible and that you have the same expectation of them so that it doesn't affect the integrity of the process. So then what happens next? Well, usually you'll go to an investigation. Who does the investigation is gonna depend on your organization. If you have an HR department, they may be the people to do it, or it could be somebody else that's appropriate. Uh, let's say HR is involved in the subject matter that's in dispute or is too close and can't be a neutral in an investigation, then they may outsource it to legal counsel or some other third party. But regardless of who is doing it, there should be a prompt investigation. If there was improper conduct, HR should determine what steps, if necessary, should be taken to address the conduct and will work with your company's employment counsel to determine the appropriate outcome. So after you report the complaint, are you done? Absolutely not, no. You have a duty then to protect the complainant from what is called retaliation. This is where most companies get in trouble, and this is probably the single most hardest claim to defend in an EEOC case because retaliation is very fact-specific. So what is retaliation? Retaliation is any adverse action taken against a person because they participated in a protected activity. And the protected activity can be complaining about harassment, it can just be being a witness in the investigation. So someone may not have come forward with anything, but the fact that they participated in the investigation itself can be a protected activity. Prohibited retaliation includes, but is not limited to, a demotion, suspension, failure to hire or consider for a hire, failure to give equal consideration in making employment decisions, failure to promote, failure to make uh, recommendations impartially, Anything that really adversely affects the working conditions or otherwise denies an employment benefit based on the participation in a protected activity. What should you do to combat harassment and minimize claims? Well, one of the first things you can do is adopt a solid policy with proper reporting channels. And so reporting channels would mean if, it, if you usually would say go to HR, as Tiffany said earlier, sometimes HR has to basically recuse themselves from that process. So if the person who is supposedly harassing someone is the director of HR, certainly someone's not going to come to HR. Similarly, if it's the CEO, while it might go to the HR, sometimes it might need to go to the board of directors because HR is not going to be able to really effectively investigate their own boss. You also need to educate employees on the policy, uh, enforce the policy. Never ignore the problems. They're not going to go away. And in fact, if you ignore them and don't document them, it will actually create more liability down the road. 
You want to review executive agreements to make sure they have policies in there that allow uh, termination for cause in the event of uh, harassment findings. Consider adopting policy on dating in the workplace, and we'll go into all these in more detail. Um, maintain EPL and DNO insurance in case there is a complaint and you've done everything you could to avoid it, that's not 100% sure that you won't get a complaint or a claim anyway. And so having insurance helps insulate you from the financial repercussions of such claims. Be willing to make hard decisions. And that's really tough because sometimes the person who's being accused and you now realize has done it might be your biggest uh, your biggest rainmaker in the organization. What do you do then? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Pardon us, we're just having a little technical. Okay. So we talked briefly about educating your employees. What does that mean? Well, that means you should conduct mandatory annual training at minimum. Um, if your organization is large enough, then you should separate the training for staff and managers because there are certain things you want to convey to your managers about how they have, uh, they can impute liability to your organization for not responding to complaints appropriately. And there are things that you may not want to tell them in a training that you not, may not necessarily want to inform your staff about. You also should publish your policy annually with the training so that employees are reminded about the importance of adhering to your policy. And document attendance at the training and make sure to keep that in their personnel file. One thing that from Jennifer and I are experienced is that if you are in the process, and if you find yourself in a situation where you have to defend an EEOC uh, charge of discrimination, oftentimes the EEOC is going to ask you about what you do to prevent harassment and discrimination in the workplace. And that's when you want to be able to explain that you do training, how often you do it, and document that the person has attended the training. Because that also means that if the person didn't follow the proper, appropriate reporting pr uh, procedures, that you have some documentation to say they were trained on the process and they failed to adhere to it. So when you talk about enforcing the policy, again, a policy only works if it is followed. So you need to make sure that your staff and your managers are adhering to the policy. There are no off the record complaints, as we talked about before. And as an HR rep, a supervisor, a manager, you are not a friend or confidant. Um, somebody in a management position has an obligation to do something when they receive a complaint. The most important thing though is to never ignore a problem. Ignoring it is never gonna make it go away. So here's our first hypothetical. Bill is the number one producer of business for XYZ. He is the highest paid employee and is best friends with the boss. He also has been sexually harassing young female employees. One employee complained many years ago and left later because she stopped getting good work after she complained. Bill has a button under his desk that allows him to lock his door without getting up. If you are ever watching the Today Show, this may sound Familiar. <laughs> um, people have gossiped for years about his inappropriate use of the button when females enter his office. A new employee has been hired and has gotten wind of this and complained to HR. If you're in HR, what should you do and what can you do? Now we know that you guys can't answer the question, so we'll answer it for you. Um, but you can't ignore this. Even though he's the number one producer of business, you have to take action. Even if you find out that Bill has been harassing people and that it's been so bad it re he needs to be terminated, it's important to realize that terminating him may end up in some business loss, but that business loss isn't going to compare to the, to the loss to the business in terms of a lawsuit that comes. Not only are you looking at possible damages financially, you're looking at the discovery process, which is very time intensive. You're looking at now what we see a lot of media attention, um, and then that alone can damage your company. We've seen, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later, just the billions of dollars in, of, of value to companies that have plummeted once a harassment complaint comes out. So you really need to do something. So the first thing you're going to do if you're HR is do an investigation. And so you're going to talk to the employees if there are still some there to really say, okay, what's been going on and finding out whether the, um, there has been any harassment. If this situation, since he's the number one producer, let's assume he is the boss or very good friends with the boss and HR is concerned about having to investigate this person, 
you could go to outside counsel or a third party investigator to have them do it so that you don't have to be concerned about reporting about Bill to the boss. Um, but ultimately, you want to do an investigation, get as much information as possible, also hear from Bill, and take the information to determine what is likely to have happened and take quick action. So let's look at this one. <clears throat> what if Kelly, the owner of an NFL team, the boss, and the highest person in the organization, is known to sexually harass her staff and subordinates? What can you do? Well, here, same type of situation almost, except here, if you're talking about the actual owner of a team, it's figuring out who can you go to. Um, there may be a trade association or somebody else that you can go to. You may have to go to outside counsel. You may have to go to a board of directors. Um, just knowing that just because someone is the boss doesn't mean that they are absolved from any sort of liability and they get a free pass to do whatever they want. This is where you have to think about what are the reporting procedures. Maybe you go to the second in command uh, about the complaint if the, the subject of a complaint is the boss and figure out who you need to take it to, um, likely probably outside counsel or someone else to deal with the situation. But you just don't let it slide. So Jennifer mentioned this before. But what are some other considerations if the alleged offender is a higher up? Well, one, if you find that there's harassment and decide to terminate someone, you need to think about some considerations. And one of those is what Jennifer mentioned before, the employment agreement. You need to check the termination provisions in that employment agreement. Is there a certain notice requirement? Are there morality clauses? Is there a required severance payment that needs to be made? And likewise, is there a clause that says that harassment is a cause for termination? These are things that you want to review when determining whether you need to terminate somebody who is higher up in the organization and has been accused of harassment. So one of the reasons that we're seeing so many more complaints these days is in part due to the Me Too which has become, movement, which has become a viral sensation. Um, a lot of people credit Alyssa Milano for being the originator of this, but it was actually been around for over a decade before that. She just brought it back into popularity as a result of sharing her own um, issues as well. But what we have is a, a media frenzy that has taken on a whole new, um, a, a new life in terms of bringing out complaints and making people feel more comfortable bringing complaints forward. So to that end, we're really not looking at a rise in, in sexual harassment. This isn't an increase of harassment. It really is more people becoming more comfortable reporting it and coming <clears throat> forward with the complaints, um, which is a good thing, uh, but it's, I don't think that harassment is just becoming more, more common. The other thing is that we're looking at is a lower threshold for, for tolerance of it. Mm -hmm. And so things that may have been okay or swept under the rug 10 years ago are not, or could have been the norm 10 years ago, are not the norm today. So you're really looking at this and scrutinizing it under a different task, um, not legally, but just from basically, a, you know, again, the court of public opinion, um, the threshold for tolerance has really, really changed. So looking at the Me Too movement, what if you learn of harassment through a Me Too social media posting? So let's take for the example, you have an employee um, who comes to you and tells you that they saw on Facebook another employee who posted something along the lines of hashtag me too. Oh my God, I can't believe my boss groped me at the employee happy hour yesterday. I don't want to go back to work. And so the employee, not the one who posted it, but the person who saw it on the Facebook account comes to you and says, I just saw this. What should we do? You have a couple of choices there. You can ignore it. It's not really a formal complaint, right? Um, Tiffany reviewed for you. There's no magic words to complain, but here the person's not coming forward to you. They just put it on social media for everyone else to see. Um, or you can ask the employee to discuss it. And our recommendation would be going with choice number two, not ignoring it. Even though the employee who posted it did not come to you directly, I would still call that person into your office and really talk to them and say, it's been brought to my attention that an event may have occurred. Can we talk about it? 
Um, and then document that, even if they don't want you to take any further action. Okay, so there are a lot of different defenses you may see um, from someone who's accused of sexual harassment um, that, that, that may come about and say, okay, I didn't do it. One of the first one is the Harvey Weinstein uh, defense, which is it was consensual. So how do you know if this defense is legitimate? Well, it's always going to usually come down to a he said, she said, or she said, she said, he said, he said. It depends on the parties that are involved. Uh, it could be because maybe the two were in a consensual relationship, but the consensual relationship went awry, and all of a sudden now there's bad blood between them. One way to address this is to consider de uh, developing a policy on dating in the workplace. Either you prohibit it, you allow it with some sort of conditions or something else. And we're going to talk about that later on in this presentation. Again, is it prohibited or is it allowed with some parameters? Um, if you put parameters on it, one of those may be that you prohibit relationships between supervisors and staff because there's a potential there for abuse of authority. And you don't want that hierarchical uh, relationship. So when we talk about the first option, no dating is allowed. Again, that's going to be easy to enforce. No dating, point blank, period. So if an employee is accused of harassment and claims it was uh, consensual, that's going to be a violation of your no dating policy because they weren't allowed to date in the first place. The second is dating allowed with limits. So again, you could allow dating in the workplace if they're between equals, meaning two people of the same level of power in the organization. This can prohibit relationships between subordinates and supervisors. Have a dating contract, possibly, that requires um, that you require to be signed by both employees, acknowledging that they are in this relationship. Again, it will set forth that the relationship is voluntary. It will put limits on their interactions at work and define potential conflicts of interest. The dating contract seems pretty, um, it can seem insane. Um, but it really can be important, even though it seems like it may be a little bit unreasonable for employees, because you're now putting it on record. You're requiring them to put the employer on record that, yes, this is a consensual relationship. You can also have certain parameters in there that show, for example, you don't want people engaging in romantic um, behaviors in a workplace at the lunchroom because that could create a, an environment that's not pleasant or welcome to employees who are then watching that and being subjected to that. It also you can require that if someone if they are dating that they're not in the same department mm -hmm. um, because what happens is like Tiffany said you've got conflicts of interest as a potential but also you've got the issue of favoritism right. and so the other thing that you would have in a dating contract if they're put on notice is that once it break, if the relationship breaks up, if it does, that they now have a duty to let you know because that was when, remember we talked about harassment, for it to be illegal harassment, it has to be unwelcome conduct. And so while they're dating, it's consensual, it's not unwelcome. But what happens if that relationship goes south and one person is still interested in the other? Well, that's what the problem is a lot of times with dating in the workplace, but if you have this quote unquote contract, that can help mitigate the damages from that in the workplace because once the person puts you on notice that they've broken up, so they let HR know that the relationship has ended, it then creates an issue where it, everyone is now on notice that this is unwelcome. And so now if the employee comes to you and says, um, you know, I just can't, I can't deal with this, he's still hounding me or she won't leave me alone, then you could have an, an unwelcome harassment claim. But what if they just break up and it's just a miserable experience and they hate each other and seeing each other, they claim, makes a hostile environment because they hate each other so much. That's not harassment. That was the assumption of the risk when they decided to date colleagues from work, and that would not be harassment. What if the defense is it's a consensual relationship? So then under option one, if the alleged offender claims it was consensual, it's a violation of that policy. So if they claim it was consensual, but you have a no dating policy, it's still a violation. So that defense does not work. Under option two, if the alleged offender claims it was consensual, it would then be documented. You'd have that contract or that documentation. Otherwise, it would be the violation of the policy. So here comes the one that probably most people will try to rely on, depending upon where the conduct took place. And that's defense number two, I was drunk. To be very, very clear, this is not a defense to harassment or assault. 
having a clear policy on alcohol in the workplace, and that includes in the workplace, meaning within, when you're within the bricks and mortars of the building or outside the workplace, when you're traveling for work, attending a work-related event, um, a work-sponsored event, a client-sponsored event, you want to make sure that your policy about alcohol consumption is very clear and that the staff understands that the policy applies both inside and outside the workplace, including at social events. If the person is an alcoholic, the reasonable accommodation here would be time off for treatment. Again, they don't get an, a get out of jail card where all of their behavior is all of a sudden excused because they have a problem. Um, what they're allowed to do is seek treatment, but they're not allowed to um, harass people, discriminate against people or anything else um, because they have a problem with alcohol. Also, to be clear, you know, we are not saying that you can't drink and you can't have fun. What we're saying is that you need to do things in moderation and that you need to understand that when alcohol is involved, people's inhibitions are lowered, they miss social cues, and things that they may not usually do um, when they're sober, they may do when they are consuming alcohol. So just be aware that alcohol is not going to ever be an excuse to any sort of harassment or assault. And, you know, looking at the training that you give to supervisors, that is something you want to explain to them very clearly is that they set the tone in the organization. And so if they are taking out their staff for happy hour and buying rounds of shot, shots, they're setting the tone that excessive drinking is welcome there. And so let's face it, a lot of bad things happen the more people drink. Tiffany talked about the lower inhibitions, but that's where we see a lot of the claims is when people are out at conferences um, or if, it, you know, again, it might be a happy hour or something like that. But that's the most important thing is that does not provide a defense to anybody. Um, and you really have to be clear with how you're, what kind of policies you have with alcohol. We are seeing more organizations adopt policies on alcohol and what is moderate and what's okay. Um, it just leads to a lot of different things. If someone gets too drunk, now you've got to decide whether you're putting them in an Uber. Uber. Could that create liability if the Uber driver assaults them? So you really do have to be careful with alcohol in the workplace. But to be very clear, it is not a defense to claim that you were drunk. And just to give you another example of what Jen just mentioned, I don't know if any of you all are familiar with Under Armour, but Under Armour was recently in the news because one of their, let's say the CEO, the chief, the head of the organization, would frequently uh, visit adult nightclubs, strip clubs, um, and expense the alcohol that was at those events. So that creates a whole bunch of problems. In addition to your expense policy, which is an issue, what that is doing is it's creating an environment where, as Jen said, the leaders of your organization are establishing a culture where drinking is going to be acceptable and, and not necessarily drinking in moderation, but drinking to extremes may be acceptable. Not to mention, if you're doing this at a strip club location, what does that say to the females in your employ in your organization? You know, that can have ramifications under the Me Too movement because now you may be sending a message that we do not value women in the same way that we value men. You may be uh, opening up um, avenues or opportunities for people to harass women in the workplace. So they were recently in the news for that. Thank goodness they uh, suspended that policy. But it's just things to think about, about how someone may think something is okay in an everyday world setting, but not understanding the ramifications that it can have on the workplace. And just talking a little bit more about alcohol and how it can inter um intersect with staff and employment. A lot of it, again, is conferences. But what if you have a board of directors? If you don't, if they don't have a code of conduct and what expectations are set out for them, you still have the issue of them potentially harassing your own employees at events when they get drunk um, or drink a little bit too much. And so one of the things if you don't already have in place for your organization is you should really strongly consider adopting a code of conduct for the board members um, as well, because that way you're putting them on notice well, they would be adopting it. Um, but then they are putting themselves on notice of what the expectations of conduct are. They should be trained annually as well so that they understand that they could cause liability to the organization if they behave themselves in an inappropriate manner at board meetings or at conferences. Um, and so they understand how that process works as well. So defense number three is the outright denial. I didn't do it. Um, this is why investigations are going to be important. You'll need to determine, as part of that investigation, who should be interviewed. 
You know, it could be only two people. It could be a myriad of people. It's all going to depend on the facts and what is presented. If it's a he said, she said, and you cannot conclude that the accused did anything wrong, you need to document why you came to that conclusion. You know, not being able to determine that somebody is in violation of a policy is still a conclusion. So that needs to be documented. The reason why is, let's say something happens with this same employee again in the future. You want to have documentation because maybe there is a pattern of behavior and it may not be a pattern that happens every year, it may happen every other year or something else, but you want to have documentation to determine whether this is a pattern. And even if it's not a pattern, you know, if somebody's been warned about behavior in the past and maybe we weren't able to prove it happened in the past, but we had a suspicion and now all of a sudden they've come along and they've done the same thing again, that's probably going to establish that it's more than likely that the person is not credible. So that's why you want to document those things. You can still require training, even if uh, you have inclusive results from your investigation, because it shows you're not ignoring the problem. So even though I can't conclusively say that, you know, Bob violated our harassment policy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send Bob to training. Or maybe I'm going to do a training across the board for all of my employees. It, what it will show, though, is that you're being proactive, and even though we didn't show that there was an issue, we're trying to make sure that we're preventing something from happening in the future. If another claim comes up in the future, documentation, again, as I said, of the prior investigation is going to be critical to that claim, especially if it is the same type of claim. And that comes into play not only in determining whether or not it happened at all, but also in, in figuring out what discipline is appropriate. Because it's one thing if the harassment is unintentional. And so we talk about, again, that unwelcome component. Um, if the person did not know that it was offensive and now they're warned and they've been told. And one example of it, which doesn't really have to do with sexual harassment, but kind of illustrates the point, is the use of the word retarded. Um, that is highly offensive. There's a low tolerance for use of that word now. Years ago, that wasn't, it didn't have the connotation it did, and it was more acceptable, I guess, um, if that's the right Social choice, point. socially acceptable than it is today. <clears throat> if someone did not realize the negative connotation of that word and was using it in the workplace, and then you know, you're know you not necessarily gonna fire them for using that word or really enact any kind of harsh discipline. However, once the person is put on notice that that word is offensive, if they continue to use it, now it's more intentional. And so now you're gonna look at more severe, um, severe uh, discipline. So the same thing with the outright denial. If you can't figure out whether it happened, it doesn't mean you don't do anything. So you take an action, or at least you have it documented. Then the next time, if someone, if there is a next time someone brings a complaint forward, it makes it more likely than not that maybe this is happening. You go back to the whole Harvey Weinstein thing, especially if it's, a, if it's an issue that seems pretty outrageous, or, or you right. look at the person and say, I just can't believe that person would do that. They're the least, per, the last person I would expect to do that. But if you now have someone else repeating the same story and noting that, you know, you're trying to keep these investigations confidential, or if there was no overlap and they wouldn't have known about the prior complaint, now even though it was he said, she said, you've got more documentation of it and you can um, move forward with that. The next defense would be, I have a problem and I need treatment. Um, there have been a lot of issues with this lately. We've seen sex addiction, addiction depression marital issues. Someone says, you know, I've been drinking more because I'm going through a divorce or I'm going through a really contentious divorce and that's why my behavior is this way. I, this is not normally how I would act. The self-loathing. There are a lot of excuses people will come up with and maybe they are really going through a hard time. But again, just like the alcoholism, that is not an excuse for the bad conduct. None of these excuse harassment or assault. And so if you're doing an investigation and someone admits to the issue but says, I have a problem and need treatment, you still have to take action because they engage in the conduct. Again, if there's a disability, and a lot of these would be considered disabilities, not the marital issues, but potentially the depression, um, the alcoholism. So if that is considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which provides a lot, I mean, the disabilities are very broad there, the time off for treatment can be the accommodation, but not as an excuse for poor conduct. You should still discipline bad conduct. So just using an example, let's say you're, you're in the middle of the investigation, you're about to terminate the person because you've determined that they did assault somebody in the workplace. So it's pretty egregious conduct. 
and they then say, oh, but I have alcoholism, can I get treatment? At that point, you do not need to give them treatment for the alcoholism because you were already going to be terminating them for the conduct. Um, so, you know, it doesn't excuse it. You can still go down the path that you are going to go down. So one thing that we mentioned early on for some best measures for employers to have is insurance coverage. You want to make sure that your organization has insurance coverage for harassment and discrimination. What does that coverage usually look like? It's in the form of what we say EPL, and that stands for Employer uh, Practices Liability, or DNO, which is Directors and Officers, policies. <clears throat> you want to look at those policies and review them annually to make sure that you have the proper coverage in place in the event that you find yourself defending uh, a charge of discrimination or harassment. Likewise, if you receive a charge or a legal complaint, not an internal complaint, you need to immediately report that to the insurance company. The reason why is you do not want the insurance company to claim that they've been prejudiced because they didn't get sufficient notice, and so therefore they're not going to cover the claim. Um, what constitutes a charge or a legal complaint is really an issue of kind of law or fact. You need to consult with counsel about that. I mean, if somebody sends you a letter and claims that they're going to uh, file a lawsuit against you, while it may not be a formal charge yet and it may not be a complaint, that's something that you want to put your insurance company on notice of because at this point they're telling you that they intend to proceed with litigation. Sometimes the um, behavior at issue could be actually criminal. And so if it's criminal conduct, if the harassment involves an assault, the employee should contact the police. And in that situation, oftentimes there'll be a criminal investigation, and you're going to need to really work hand in hand with the police to make sure whatever you're doing is not interfering with their investigation. And typically what I would recommend is, especially if the person is arrested, suspending them without pay pending the outcome of the criminal matter. If it's, if it's, if it's later determined that it had no merit, or was the complaint was brought in bad faith, you can always reinstitute the pay. But having them not come in when it's criminal and kind of staying your, your investigation at that point so that you're not stepping on the toes of the police is really important. You want to cooperate with the police, um, but if they're issuing subpoenas and things like that, you should consult with counsel first. You might want to require a subpoena for the documents, have counsel review the documents first with you. Um, the criminal investigation can bring on a whole host of other issues, but most importantly, just not interfering with the criminal investigation. If you witness the assault, you can contact the police, but I don't really recommend contacting the police for the employee. Mm -hmm. So if they come to you, you didn't witness it, you want to encourage them to call the police, but you don't want to call them for that person. The most important thing there, though, is to preserve all records, tapes, recordings. So if it happened and you have video footage of it, you want to definitely collect that and preserve that. If there are any complaints that came in, emails about it, you want to preserve all of those. So the other thing we talked about is, um, or we mentioned, is settlement agreements, which some call it, sometimes can be called as hush money. Just know that those are not going to fix anything. Um, when the Me Too movement first came about, we learned about a lot of settlement agreements that were entered into with regard to our elected officials on Capitol Hill and how you know women were coming forward and breaching the confidentiality provisions of those agreements in order to allow their stories to be told. So just know that they are not, settlement agreements are not iron, ironclad kind of gag orders. They may not prevent somebody from talking about the uh, the merits of whatever the complaint was, even though you have a confidentiality provision in there. However, they can be valuable, but they should not be used in lieu of discipline or an investigation. So if somebody comes forward with a complaint and you think there's some merit to it, and then you go to the accused and say, here's what we're going to do, or you go to the person who's bringing the complaint and say, here's what we're going to do, things aren't going working out, we'll agree to pay you X, um, and you can leave the organization because it's not a good fit. Just because the person who's made a complaint decides to leave doesn't mean that you don't still do an investigation. It doesn't mean that the accused may not be subject to some sort of discipline because what happens when the next person comes along? This is why you need to investigate and take action. It's kind of like the Harvey Weinstein issue that we talked about before where people knew what was going on and nobody did anything. You have an obligation to do something once you've been put on notice of a potential claim or complaint. 
Also, if you don't do an investigation um, or, you know, do any discipline and all you do is a person comes forward and complains and you pay them money to go away, that can become evidence of notice of the problem and a failure to act appropriately. So that's why you want to make sure that you are responding appropriately to complaints. So what we've seen now that there is much uh, a smaller threshold for what's allowed um, in the workplace, which is a good thing, it's a very positive development, is that it really can cost the company a lot of money um, dealing with sexual harassment claims, especially if they're not handled appropriately. There are the direct costs, and the direct costs would be the cost of the settlement if the claim is resolved. You know, if you enter into a severance agreement with the complaining party, that severance agreement is a direct cost to the organization. Attorney's fees. Anytime you're hit with a sexual harassment claim mm. with the EEOC, <laughs> even though you're not required to get counsel, I would definitely get counsel to help represent you there because what you're putting out there could be discoverable later. And if it's not handled appropriately, there could be a finding of, um, of probable cause. So your attorney's fees are going to be a direct cost. But what about the indirect costs, which there are many? The increased insurance premiums. If you were, if you do have EPL and DNO insurance, and the claim is filed with them, it could increase your insurance premium. Um, increased labor costs due to turnover. If you have a, a revolving door, that's going to be an indirect cost to your organization because every time you onboard a new employee, it costs money. You are investing in them when you hire a new employee because you expect that they're going to work out and you want them to. So you're training. So while you're training, the person who's doing the training is not necessarily doing their other work. So all of those are indirect costs. Um, absenteeism from work. If someone is going through or experiencing a hostile environment, you're likely going to see increased absenteeism. They're not going to be wanting to come to work. Um, and you may not know why, but now the person's not there and you've got that indirect cost. Reputational damage, and that is one that you really can't put a value on. Um, the you know if this if this has credibility and sometimes even when they don't again the public just generally assumes that it happened if a complaint is is brought um, which has become an issue but the reputational damage sometimes you're going to need to hire a publicist to help you deal with that media coverage um, media coverage can result in a very public lashing which can, which can directly affect the profits and value of the company. The financial health of the organization can be severely impacted as a result. So some real life examples of costs of sexual harassment claims um, are seen just in the past year with what we've seen. And again, a lot of times this is just a claim that's made before it's even been investigated. But when it's been investigated or the person is terminated, that results in a quick uh, change in profit. So one of those is Les Moonves, um, who's the former CEO of CBS. And this just happened probably not even maybe four months ago, where a news report came out about sexual harassment allegations against him. As a result, and again, we're talking about allegations, CBS's stock initially dropped by 6% just from those allegations. We have Steve Wynn, the big casino mogul in uh, Las Vegas. After accusations of sexual harassment were made against him, Wynn Resort saw a $3 billion drop in market value, which is huge. That's a big impact on your business. And then we have Paul Marciano, who is the co-founder of Guest Clothing Wear. After he was accused of sexual harassment, Guess's stock fell 18%. So it's clear that sexual harassment allegations can greatly affect the financial health of any organization. And with that, we are going to open it up to questions. Thank you. And now we're going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Here is our first question. If we want to train our staff and managers, is this something mm -hmm. that WTP can do? Absolutely. That's something we'd be willing to do. Um, we can work with you on how you want to do that. If you want to do it through a platform of a webinar and in-person training, but we can do that. And we would also tailor it to your policies, um, your employee handbook and whatever you have currently existing in your organization, as well as maybe make some recommendations of what you should consider changing. But we can certainly do that training. And as part of the training, it's really important that it's done well. 
And so there are ways you can train employees that actually might create more liability for them. So as part of the messaging, when you're training staff, is you want to make sure that they understand what is harassment, but more importantly, what isn't harassment. And so whatever training you do, um, you want to make sure that it's very clear that petty slights, you know, someone commenting and saying, you look nice today, is not harassment. And so a lot of times people use the word hostile work environment pretty freely, but it really has a very specific legal terminology and really educating staff on what that really means. So people don't just throw that term around so loosely anymore, um, but it really is important. Like training is one of the most important things you can do for your organization. And like Tiffany said, it should be done annually, but it's really important that the messaging is on point. And so that you're not just now saying, here's our policy, come forward, you know, this is what sexual harassment is, but you're really explaining what harassment isn't. And at that time, you can also combine it with you know, training on discrimination, not just sexual harassment. You, might, you want to hit all of the areas, so you're not bringing them back repeatedly, repeatedly. You're going over your policies and things like that and making sure that you're doing your manager training, which is different, so they understand what their role in the organization is, why they can create liability, and what their duties are upon receipt of a complaint. And in addition, just to put this plug out there, because we're coming up on the holiday season and some companies will be having holiday parties where alcohol may be served, this is also a good time to recirculate those policies about what is acceptable behavior in the workplace, including your harassment and discrimination policies. To remind folks that when you go to those events and even though alcohol is served, it's not going to be an excuse for bad behavior. Thank you. Our next question. What should you do if a person comes to you with a concern or a complaint but tells you they don't want to take any action? So that's going to, it's a great question. <clears throat> that's going to depend on what your role in the organization is. If you're an HR um, or you're a supervisor, you absolutely still need to do something about it. If you're just a staff member, not just, but if you're on the same playing field as the person who comes to you, you don't necessarily have a duty to do anything. But as a supervisor or someone in HR, you absolutely have a duty. Now, what that duty is, is you could call the person in and say, or they're talking to you and they're complaining, and you would say, okay, um, I understand you don't want to. I have a requirement to report it. And if they say, absolutely, no, don't do it, you're going to do document that anyway. You're going to go back and email the employee and say, I just wanted to confirm that you came to me with this complaint today and you told me you do not want me to do anything. Um, and then if they don't respond back, you've got documentation of it. And why that's so important, and I would still go ahead and copy or forward that to HR so they have um, notice of it if HR wasn't in the loop. Um, before sending the email, I would still talk to HR and just tell them this is what you're planning. And the reason for that um, is because later down the road, if the relationship sours with the employee who came to you and complained and you didn't do anything in response to it because you were doing what they asked you to do, which was nothing, they may, and you don't have documentation of that, they will likely use that if they're trying to pursue a claim on behalf of the organization to say, I put you on notice of this issue and you didn't do anything. You ignored and, it. Right. And so at that point, they could potentially allege some kind of retaliation if an adverse action happened after that, even though they really weren't doing anything. Um, or if the, you know, their performance suffered, you just always want to document that. Um, similarly, why you want to keep HR in the loop is, once you've confirmed they don't want you to do anything, HR may be on notice at that point and if there are any other issues that come up, it'll again be more likely than not it happened. Um, but you absolutely want to do something, at least documenting that they want you to do nothing is something. Thank you. And we have no more questions at this time. So I would like to thank Tiffany and Jennifer and thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Managing Liability in the Me Too Era. If you have any questions, please contact Whitford, Taylor, and Preston. And on behalf of Whitford, Taylor, and Preston, Leading Edge Maryland, and our presenters today, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.